Okay. Paul Mall Art Advisors is pleased to present part four of our market webinar series, Opportunities Admits Crisis, Identifying stressed, Distressed Art and Real Estate Markets. My name is Colleen Boyle, and I'm the Senior Vice President at Paul Mall Art Advisors, and I'll be today's moderator. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar is being recorded, and a copy of the recording will be sent to all registered attendees. We would like to address any questions that you may have throughout the seminar, so please submit your questions to the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Joining us on the panel today are top experts in art and real estate. Chris Ainsworth, Managing Director and Market Manager at Deutsche Bank Trust Company Americas, will begin the presentation by giving us an economic update, followed by Brendan Mendel, the Managing Director of Real Estate for Deutsche Bank Trust Company. Brian will be discussing opportunities for distressed real estate. Anita Harriet, the President of Paul Mall Art Advisors, will be addressing the opportunities in the art market. And we'll conclude today's panel with Brad Cohen, who's a partner at Jeffer, Mangles, Butler, and Mitchell, who will be sharing his insight regarding tax opportunities and implications of COVID-19 on planning. So Chris, we're gonna start with you by providing us with an, up, an economic update. All right, thank you, Colleen. And I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank Anita, Anita and all of the uh, Paul Mall uh, team for putting this seminar together and inviting us uh, to be a part of it. So thank you very much. Um, it's really a, an amazing time to look at what's going on in the world, what's going on in the US economy, and look at what's going on out there. Um, when you take a little bit of a step back um, and look at what has happened over the last couple of years and look at the stock market and how people have felt about what's going on in the economic environment and the investment environment, um, you've really seen massive swings. But when you look at what happened in late 2018, when the market declined in Q4 of 2018, um, there was a massive amount of bearish sentiment in the uh, towards the stock market and what future expectations were going to be. That in turn produced a huge return for the stock market, specifically the S&P uh, in 2019. And so at the end of 2019, we saw an environment where most economists and most market pundits felt like 2020 was gonna be a banner year. We were gonna continue the rally and the run that we saw in 2019. And we didn't get through the first quarter where we saw a drastic change in sentiment given what's taken place on a global perspective. And so when you look at what's happened, we've started with a health crisis with COVID-19 Clearly, I'm not a doctor, so I can't speak to the, uh, you know, all the medical issues associated with this virus. But as a trained economist, I can speak to the economic and financial impact. So we started with a health crisis. We've now transferred into or we're migrating into an economic crisis. And that's also layering in a financial crisis. So which, when you look at what's happened, I'll start with the United States. The United States, as of this morning, we saw another addition to the jobless claims. So the weekly jobless claims added another 2.98 million over the last week. That brings the total over this crisis over the last eight weeks to 36.5 million jobs lost. That is by far the biggest and fastest job losses in the history of the United States um, and since records have been kept. When you look at what's happened more specifically, the April jobs report that was reported last Friday showed 20.5 million people out of work and the unemployment rate has gone on a month over month basis from 4.2% to 14.7%. But a broader perspective on unemployment, which is the U6, which measures um, broader unemployment, has gone from 8.9% to 22.4%. What's interesting about that is the cutoff for that April jobs report was actually in the middle of the month. And so you don't capture all of those weekly claims. It's also formulaic driven, which assumes a certain amount of companies and a certain amount of jobs are being created. What we also found when we looked through that jobs report even deeper 
was that they reduced the workforce and they reduced the participation rate. So in essence, what you saw was an evaporation of some of the numbers that should have been counted. So when you count those back in, you could have easily gotten to an 18% jobs report. And that is, again, just looking at that mid-month cutoff. So don't be surprised when we get a May jobs report that, again, sees a material increase um, in the unemployment rate in the coming weeks. What's also interesting is the perception of what's happened, and that's why you've seen a market rally in the stock market over the last couple of weeks up until this week from those lows in March. 78% of the people that are unemployed believe that it is short-term or temporary. But what's also interesting about that is that the majority of people in the United States now believe that they will be in worse economic shape or significantly worse economic shape a year from now than where they are today. So again, we're seeing these strange dynamics take place. The response since the crisis has taken place has been both monetary and fiscal. From the monetary side, the Fed has cut rates down to zero. They've added huge amounts of liquidity, similar to what they did in 2008, back into the financial markets and trying to keep the financial system liquid and available to make sure that transactions can move forward. At the same time, on the fiscal side, out of Washington, we've seen three packages passed, the biggest of which was the CARES Act, which was $2.2 trillion. This added, for the first time, money for unemployment from the national level. Most unemployment claims and most unemployment payments are done at the state level. You also now get an unemployment check from the federal government. At the same time, we've seen checks sent out to the majority of Americans, also commonly referred to universal basic income in broader economic terms. People are receiving checks. We've also seen the addition of PPP, the Payment Protection Plan, and we've seen other types of bailout specific industries such as airlines and specific types of companies. We've also seen Congress, all of those prior economic stimulus packages have started in the Senate and started by the Republican Party. At this point, the next stimulus, which has been announced, has been started in Congress and has been pushed by the House, which is the Democratic Party and Nancy Pelosi. You've seen them come out with $3 trillion package, most of it focused on state and, state and local governments. But what's interesting is how this is now starting to play out. The second round of PPP has not seen the same level of drawdown and seen the same level of commitment from small businesses that the first round saw. What we're starting to see is some degree of fatigue out of Washington and wanting to see how what has been sent so far, spent so far plays out. So the Republicans are starting to balk and they wanna to start to see how some of this plays out before they move forward with additional economic stimulus specifically related to the state and local governments. Additionally, the next round of stimulus after this $3 trillion out of uh, focused on state and local governments is gonna be focused on infrastructure. This is something that's been kind of um, out there for multiple years. It's something that's very important for the long-term health of the US economy, but it's something that takes a long time. And at this point, given the amount of cost that's gonna be associated with it and the amount of time that it's gonna to take to implement, this may be the first time in decades that you are able to pass a long-term infrastructure plan that supports roads, um, airports, and different types of infrastructure on a national basis. What's also interesting in Washington is the battle that's going on in the rhetoric between the United States and China. It's gotten a, to a fever pitch and it is absolutely terrible at this point. The phase one trade deal that China and the United States agreed to earlier this year was an expectation that China was going to be buying $263 billion worth of goods this year. What we have seen and what the current data is suggesting is that they're on track to buy $60 billion worth of goods this year. That, along with the rhetoric related to who is responsible and who is to blame for this virus spreading around the world, has created a huge amount of tension between the United States and China, and we're seeing it emanate across the board in how this is potentially playing out. 
finally, when you talk about reopening, we're seeing many states start to reopen. We're starting to look at what the economic impact looked like. The first thing that you have to address related to that is trust, and the people have to feel confident that they're going to be safe when they go out. That needs to happen. You may open up the states, but until people feel comfortable, the economic rebound that everybody is expecting is going to take significantly longer and be significantly lower than people think. What we are seeing is states that's opened up. We've seen a huge increase in cases. Um, you look at Texas, Minnesota, and other states. Uh, we've also seen hospitalizations go up. And the economic impact has been significant at this point. But states have to open up given how much economic pain we're, we're seeing across the board. The expectations are that this was a Q1 and Q2 event, and current ec economists are expecting a strong recovery for Q3 and Q4. As of right now, those expectations have to come in. When you look at what the S&P 500 companies did in 2019, combined earnings for the S&P 500 was $164. Currently, the expectations for 2020 are 127, but 2021 earnings are still expected to be back near the 2019 levels of 162, which implies a V-shaped recovery. A lot has to take place for that type of economic recovery to, take, to play out. Current market expectations are going to be, have to be driven by vaccines, treatment, accurate testing, and people being comfortable going out, much like I talked about a few seconds ago. We're still learning a great deal about that virus, and until we get our arms around that, the economic impact is still going to be strong. What's interesting, though, is the U.S. is really the best of a bad situation. I know the numbers are high in the United States, but the U.S. does have huge amounts of testing going on, and they are trying to get their arms around it. Additionally, layering on top of that, U.S. corporate flexibility and their ability to adapt in Washington, both out of the fiscal and monetary stimulus, have put ourselves in a situation to rebound faster than other economies around the world. I'm not saying this is going to be easy, but when you look at what the implications are on a global basis, the U.S. is positioning themselves to rebound at whatever level that starts to take place and however slowly or fast that may transpire. So across the world, we're starting to see huge amounts of transitions. We're seeing people um, start to go back to work, but we're also seeing rising in cases. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But don't expect that V-shape recovery. We would expect this to play out significantly longer than people expect. I know that we're tight on time. There's a lot to talk about, so I'm happy to answer any other questions later on about how this relates to Europe, how this relates to Asia, and what their economic impact is going forward. On that, Colleen, I'll turn it back over to you. Colleen, you're muted. Colleen, you're muted. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for uh, the economic overview and for all the statistics. Um, in light of all that information, um, Brian, we're finding that the workspace has changed dramatically uh, during this COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, individuals are, are furloughed, unessential businesses are shut down. People who are uh, have the opportunity to work are actually working remotely uh, in a home situation. Uh, restaurants, food establishments uh, are offering curbside pickup or delivery via DoorDash and other entities. Can you opine how COVID-19 is impacting the real estate market? Yes, thank you, Colleen. Uh, so picking up on one of Chris's comments, which is that we're entering an extremely interesting market right now, uh, focusing purely on the real estate market, 2019 into 2020 was uh, an incredible market run. Of course, it was helped by the, the sell-off in the market at the end of 2018, but we still saw just unbelievable market performance. Uh, now we're in a period of uncertainty that feels like it's gonna be prolonged and continue to run on for a while here. Price discovery is really challenging. Uh, this is given significant volatil volatility in the market and really no transparency for what's happening in the private markets at this point in time. My comments on the presentation here will focus mostly on the public markets because it's the easiest place to, 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 to gather the most information right now. 
uh, and provides us at least some thoughts on valuations uh, and where investors are looking at, uh, at values and opportunities on the property side. Uh, on the next slide, we, we look at the, uh, the initial sell-off, which was really driven by the uncertainty around COVID-19, uh, happened incredibly quickly starting in the beginning of March, uh, but was closed up also relatively quickly uh, after a couple different events happened. And Chris walked through a lot of this, but it was driven by uh, the Fed stimulus, which when you deploy at least 40%, and what seems like it's going to be a lot more of GDP back into the markets, it's really hard to argue against the fact that markets are going to rally pretty heavily around that. Uh, very significant liquidity that is in the investment community and has been supporting the markets, particularly on the back of, of the Fed stimulus. And then also a lot of investors starting to differentiate between uh, various asset classes. And there will be a number of asset classes that do benefit. And then as Colleen was mentioning, there will be some that will be challenged like office space. Uh, but we are starting to see investors differentiate between who are going to be the winners and who are going to be the ones who suffer the most. So stimulus and liquidity are definitively the driving factors right now behind the market, uh, the market, uh, the strength in the market over the last uh, seven or eight weeks here. Uh, my, my opinion on what's happened is really the markets have been driven by this macro euphoria but micro uncertainty is gonna persist. So we're gonna see strength across some sectors and we're gonna see uncertainty across others. And there'll be good news that comes out, and there'll be bad news that comes out, and it'll create just an ongoing volatility that will persist for a while. On the next slide, we do look at this volatility. The main measure, uh, oh sorry, uh, the next slide we look at uh, the unemployment side. Unemployment is clearly going to be a challenge here. Chris mentioned the unbelievable numbers that are coming out. Uh, the view in the marketplace really is that we're gonna see much higher unemployment than what we entered with. And the concern there is just no investor really understands what that means. And if you think about it from a real estate perspective, with unemployment right now that's in the mid-teens, when it starts to rally at some point, where does it end? But that means lower use of office space, lower use of hotels for business travel, also lower use of hotels for personal travel if people are unable to, uh, to afford travel. Uh, it also could impact a lot of the, the, uh, the home and apartment rental markets. So it's gonna create just a huge contagion within the real estate space that's gonna leave a lot of uncertainty. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we look at uh, various REIT performance around the, uh, the, 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 the coronavirus, the pandemic here. And what we see is um, a lot of, a, lot of a, a big differentiation between whom we think will emerge uh, uh, with wind behind their backs and who we think will have tailwind running at them. The clear winners, uh, are going to be those where we're seeing uh, real uh, investment, both from government perspective, but also from the, uh, the investor community. That's going to be things like industrial, where you've got huge uh, uh, adoption on uh, uh, growth of people ordering things from online sites. So just the, emer the continued emerging online tech uh, community. Other things like cold storage, where cold storage and then lab space as well are almost matters of national security, where you're going to have the government really focused on the ability to uh, uh, cold storage is, is the, the protection of uh, both food and then also things like medications, which need to be moved from location to location before they reach their ultimate destination, which would be pharmacies to food stores. Uh, critical infrastructure there, and also lab space where you're gonna see not only government investment into things like uh, inoculation defense and testing and whatnot, but also a lot of venture capital investment. Uh, digital infrastructure, we're all sitting here on a video call. We will continue to see more and more investment into digital infrastructure, which is gonna be things like data centers and cell towers. Uh, and then also the concept of ground leases, which on the public side is an emerging asset class, on the private side has been a large high net worth investment asset for a long time. Uh, these leases have gained huge traction after the after a huge interest from investors after the, uh, the announcement of COVID. 
uh, primarily driven by one publicly traded company that invests into ground leases, but also just from the fact that ground leases tend to be an inflation protected asset. So as we're looking at governments borrowing uh, huge sums of money here and the potential inflation ramifications that can come from that, these leases tend to have five or 10 year inflation adjustments attached to them. So if rent, if rent uh, adjustments, which usually are 2% per year, are trailing inflation, then we see these kickers that, that come in and, uh, and true up the rental payment. So as investors look at where they want to deploy their money, those are sectors that are capturing a lot of attention. And then we get some that are impacted. Uh, there's some that are going to be lightly impacted, things like single family and multifamily and storage, where you would think that there's going to be a growth in those asset classes just given the unemployment outlook uh, and also the desire, increased desirability of mobility from various people. Uh, but clearly, unemployment trends are going to create some, some headache there. And on the multifamily side, uh, there is a little bit of concern about people who are living in apartment buildings. I mean, I'm sure everyone in this call knows people. I have plenty of colleagues in New York City who are stuck inside their apartments and have a hard time getting out. Uh, things like that will impact it, but we do believe that part of this pandemic is going to be an increased desirability of rental uh, and storage where there's a little bit of uncertainty from the unemployment side about the ability to pay for your storage sites. Uh, we do believe long term that that will continue to have viability as people look at, at both the ability to move, the ability to downsize space, and the ability to be pretty flexible and using storage to their advantage there. Uh, and then also on the residential real estate side where uh, we are seeing, we're hearing a lot of trends, uh, both in the Northeast, the West Coast, but also the Southeast, of people looking at moving out of apartment buildings and condos and into single family rental. So we do think that there's going to be some desirability on the single family side uh, as markets start to rebound. And then you get into asset classes where there's going to be more of a higher impact. Uh, and these are a lot of the ones that are going to be pretty obvious, but it's things like retail. Uh, are people really going to go to shopping malls in, uh, 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 as much as they used to going forward? That was an asset class that was under pressure coming into this. And it feels like that pressure is really going to accelerate. Uh, strip centers relatively similar where you have uh, you have grocery stores that are performing very well and then you have anchor tenants things like sporting goods stores and clo larger clothing discounted clothing retailers who are unable to open and doing things like curbside sales to the extent they can uh, over to uh, restaurants which are doing curbside pickup uh, the future of those businesses feels like uh, strip centers will will have some viability, but there will certainly be challenges to them as well. And it's really uncertain as to what that will look like. Hotels are another example where it's kind of hard to figure out when when are when is business travel going to pick up and when is personal travel going to pick up and what will that look like and how will hotels be able to sustain this? I do think there's viability there, but I think it's going to take a little bit of time to figure out what that's going to look like. Uh, mortgage finance is another example where we're just in an in a, uh, environment where the publicly traded mortgage finance companies, as well as a number of the private mortgage financing funds, were using pretty excessive leverage from banks. And just given the fact that a lot of borrowers are unable to pay right now, there's a huge amount of stress in that sector. And the going forward viability of that, while it will, it will exist, it's going to be challenged to a good degree. Uh, and the last sector is, is the condominium sector, uh, where it, it's, it's a little bit uh, questionable as to how long it will take the condo market to, re to rebound uh, and how long it's going to take before we see people really showing a lot of interest in buying apartments. That really gets to when we start to see growth emerge. And we think that this uncertainty is going to persist for a while until we have clarity around four real factors. Number one, we talked about, which is unemployment. The second is going to be consumer spending trends. We've seen a little bit of it online, but we haven't, no one's really had the ability in a lot of areas uh, to go back to stores. And that's going to be a factor that we're going to be watching pretty closely to see when, when consumers are able to go back and really start spending money. Uh, the next part, which is going to be the office space and retail space, and when we're going to see the utilization of that. 
Uh, Colleen mentioned at the beginning, which is a lot of people are not going into the office, and now every time you pick up the newspaper, you're reading about the next CEO, whether it's Warren Buffett or the CEO of Barclays, is coming out and saying that they're unclear what the future is going to be for their office utilization. Clearly, there's going to be a need for office going forward, but the use of that is really going to change. And when you talk to people, there are people who believe that we're going to need to space out more. So in the last couple of years, we've taken the number, the headcount per square foot up significantly. So we've shrunk the, the footprint that we've used. And now the belief is we're going to have to expand that. Uh, so is the expansion going to be enough to counteract the, the number of people who are going to be working from home or working remotely remains to be seen. And retail, we're, we're already in a period where we're seeing massive retail bankruptcy, and that feels like that's going to continue to accelerate here. Uh, what is the future of retail going to look like, and how is that space going to be able to be utilized? And then the last part is going to be travel, uh, and how travel will come back, and when people will be ready to use hotels and casinos, uh, and even vacation rental by owners, when we start to see that picking up. Uh, those, that, those levels of uncertainty are really going to be what, what, uh, what caps our ability to tell you when growth will start to reemerge. And we think it'll take a while for a lot of these to start to work their way through. There are a few states that are opening, uh, and we think the growth is really going to be focused around a lot of the states where we're seeing reopening, and those are the southeast and the southwest. And to anybody who's followed real estate markets closely, that shouldn't be a surprise because that's been, those have been the markets where we've seen the most growth lately. Uh, a lot of that was driven by things like lower, lower tax, uh, lower tax uh, state income tax thresholds within those states, and also more desirable real estate prices. Uh, in the near term, we think major cities are going to be the losers. Although that will likely rebound, typically out of any of the uh, out of any of the the major events that we've seen occur, uh, whether it's terrorist events or pandemics or just market sell-offs, a lot of people get concerned about cities. Uh, but the allure always comes back, and young people like to live in and around cities, so we do think that that will come back. But again, it's a function of when. Uh, so. Right now, what we're focused on uh, are trying to uncover the opportunities that are going to come out of this. And there, there's four that I think are the most interesting for investors on this call. The first is arbitraging the markets. Uh, if you look at where we have dislocation right now, it's things like there's no lending market. And so the ability to try to lend where banks are not. Uh, investing into growth sectors, so finding opportunities in things like industrial assets or cold storage assets or lab space. Uh, you can do that through the public markets and there are opportunities there. You can also do that through investing with, with private investors. Uh, and then there's things like uh, residential inventory. And if you look at, uh, at condominium markets in major, seller, in major cities uh, or uh, home builder inventory where they've been building in suburban areas, uh, there's a lot of these people who are stuck with inventory they need to move and there might be the ability to buy, buy properties uh, at interesting pricing. The second is investing into the public markets where, where and when they're stressed. Uh, the equity markets offer obvious opportunities. Uh, and then there's more uh, complicated opportunities, but things like single assets, single borrower CMBS deals, so, uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities transactions. These obviously require you to be a, a, a qualified investor, but it's an opportunity, single asset, meaning it's one asset within the trust, so you can underwrite it and understand it pretty quickly and come up with a view on it. And they, they're, they're things that are not, not TALF eligible, so not available for the, the financing programs. So you can capture unique, unique uh, dislocation on the pricing side. Uh, there are growth equities right now where we're seeing dislocation. And then there's also dislocation on the bond side, uh, particularly around things like, like hotel companies and gaming companies where there's uncertainty about the future. But if you can come up with a view on, on where those are valued, there's real opportunity there. Uh, for high net worth investors and for anybody who's followed opportunity zones, there's a real opportunity right now to look at distressed land or redevelopment plays which would work incredibly well for opportunity zones. Uh, and then there's also the ability to take advantage of the, uh, the, the incredibly low interest rates right now. And uh, just in the newspapers right now, there's further talk about the Fed taking interest rates to negative. So as the lending markets start to come back, uh, 
the ability to either refinance properties or take out new loans on properties at what's going to be just a, uh, uh, never seen interest rates before. Uh, Ryan, so, Ryan, yes, real quick, uh, we have a question that's come in, and then we're gonna have to move on to the, to sure. the next segment of the panel. Um, but just you mentioned earlier about uh, cities and uh, real estate prices in major cities. So cities such as San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, where currently real estate prices are, are on the higher side. Do you think that with COVID-19, there's going to be a readjustment uh, to pricing, possibly obviously lower in those particular environments? In, in the short term, there definitely will be. As you start to get periods of volatility in the markets and uh, in unemployment, there, there always is, there always are people who need to sell and that creates dislocation. Uh, longer term, those cities just have a desirability, and so it's going to be hard to imagine there's going to be a real prolonged period of distress, but if your interest is in looking at New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, ma major gateway markets like that, this is a great time to be thinking about buying real estate in those markets. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Brian, and we're going to move on uh, to Anita with, uh, with discussion around the art market. Let's move our slide. There we go, back one. Okay. So Anita, from this uh, ecosystem, is one art of the ecosystem more important than the others? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Colleen. Um, first of all, I want to thank Brian for introducing a new vocabulary word that I'm going to try to use on a daily basis, macro euphoria. Thank you so much, Brian. I, I love that term. Um, but let, let's talk about the art ecosystem. Um, I think a lot of people don't really understand the, the way in which each of these parts of the system work together. And if one part falters, it has a huge impact on the entire ecosystem. It is a very delicate balance. So just so you can quickly understand the relationship between the different parts, and that would, would address your question, Colleen. You know, I, on this kind of cycle, you can see I have the auction houses. Um, and I'm going to talk about what's happening to the auction houses, but the auction houses really are kind of the central marketplace for the movement of art. It's the most transparent. So it's a, it allows us to kind of really understand what's happening in terms of pricing and valuation. Related to that, obviously, are the museums. And I know a lot of folks don't think of museums as part of the art market ecosystem, but in fact, the museums are an essential part of the art market ecosystem. And that's for a variety of reasons. So for instance, right now, all the museums are closed with an attempt at obviously virtual exhibitions. But every time an exhibition emerges um, that is of, a, of an artist, that actually is a signal to the art market. So when we don't have blockbuster exhibitions, um, that has an impact on the value of that particular artist. The dealer market, which is who are highly associated with the auction marketplace and the museum market, think of it this way, dealers filtering artworks for exhibition, working with museums to create exhibitions, focusing on artists that they wanna push and having them move to museums. And then at the same time, dealers being major buyers at auction house, but also a lot of the consignments at auction are through dealers. And then you have your art advisors who are kind of negotiating through all of these different systems, working with dealers, working with auction houses, working with museums. And lastly, the collector. So, you know, Brian um, and Chris very clearly articulated that currently our economy is having a, a very significant downfall. Well, what impact will that be on the collector of the artwork? Will they have to sell their artwork? Are, is this a time where they're going to be buying their artwork? Are, they, are there opportunities for them to exhibit and booster their particular artists? So all of these parts are intricately kind of associated with each other. Not one is more important than the other, but when one falters, it has a huge impact on the entire balance system. And Anita, that being said, uh, you mentioned about selling. Um, we're seeing now, obviously, a lot of online sales because the actual auction houses have postponed their, um, their, their major sales. And, and there's actually been some very strong results on the online platform. However, 
do you anticipate buyers feeling confident enough to with this particular process to buy or sell paintings priced above a certain price point? So for example, do you, do you anticipate buyers uh, buying or selling artwork that would be priced say above a $5 million price point? So a couple things here. This is our first, fourth webinar. And with every webinar, <laughs> we've had to update the auction information, right? Because it's a, it's a moving target. Um, we really see that, you know, June and July are going to be kind of our windows into the health of the marketplace in COVID. So COVID health, which is a contradiction in terms, <laughs> of course. Um, but those will really be the lenses. We actually have auctions happening in the next couple days, one actually today, in which works are above a certain threshold. So we're going to see um, works that are offered in the millions. And it will be very interesting to understand, you know, where the appetite is is for those works of art. However, here's the rub. Um, you know, a work of art that is a $5 million work of art requires um, real due diligence. So it's the extent to which the auction houses can provide that due diligence, which allows buyers to feel real comfort. So for instance, you know, we're interested in a potential work that's coming up um, in a couple days and what did we need in order because it's in the millions what did we need in order to feel comfort for acquisition we need a you know a video we need their condition report we need a third party condition report right we need um all of that information for us even to consider bidding and then there's still that feeling that when you get it back when you actually buy the work of art you know what if it doesn't look like you anticipated it would look in person. So all of these components make it a very scary time to buy at auction. However, when the due diligence is performed, um, meaning we see videos, we have third party condition reports by very you know, well-known conservators, when we um, have all the information for the due diligence, I think, collectors will feel such a desire and need to buy that their finger will, will touch the laptop and they will be buying online in the millions. Anita, another question just came. Whoop. You've, you've just uh, muted yourself. Okay. Uh, an attendee just sent in a question. Sellers are still trying to get pre-COVID pricing. How long will it take before pricing comes into post-COVID pricing? Do you actually think there will be a decrease in pricing because yeah. of the COVID quarantine? If you could address that, Anita. Absolutely. And I am actually going to address that um, in the next couple slides, but let me kind of respond to it right now. Um, when you say um, they're looking for pre-COVID pricing, the question is who? right? Is this the auction, the auction uh, that you're talking about? Are you talking about dealers? Are you talking about private sellers? I think currently in the private market, people are still asking big prices, right? Um, because they haven't, it's not an opaque, it's an opaque market. It's not transparent. Um, but I think when we look to the auction marketplace, you know, there are going to be much more realistic estimates that reflect what's happening um, currently in the market. So you have to really look at that marketplace to ask that kind of question, um, but I'll address it even further when we look at opportunities in terms of pricing. I did want everyone to get some sense of where the, the market leaders, um, who are the market leaders, because as you can see, and this is very much related to what Chris and Brian have discussed, the United States is the market leader in the art market. And therefore, um, there is a direct correlation between what is happening in our economy and um, either appetite for acquisition um, and or necessity for sale. The difference is between some of the, the luxury, you know, the, what Brian was discussing and our area of the marketplace, this is a luxury asset, right? It's a passion asset and a luxury asset. So there's a little bit of an elevated um, in terms of who acquires these works of art. You know, you have, it's really, you know, high net worth and ultra high net worth clients tend to be buyers of artwork. So it's the extent, if we could kind of subdivide our analysis of the economy, the extent to which the economy is directly going to impact high net worth and ultra high net worth um, clients. How many of them are going to lose their job? 
the correlation with real estate is that a lot of our clients are heavy in the real estate market. A lot of them um, own a lot of real estate or they are, you know, own a lot of commercial real estate. And as that starts to trickle down and impact their portfolio value, I anticipate that to have the greatest impact on, um, you know, the distressed assets that are going to enter the marketplace. I just wanted to give everyone a sense of what we've been dealing with in the art market for the last year. You know, before COVID, we already were extremely worried about the art market. You know, with the Brexit deal, there was an anticipation that this would have a huge impact on, you know, as you saw in the last chart, um, the UK is one of the biggest um, buyers in the art market, although a lot of them are international within the UK. So we anticipated already there would be new tax issues. Um, we didn't know the price of the pound as that would develop with Brexit. So there was a lot of concern already in the market. And we were all tracking the UK sales and they were not as strong as we had anticipated. And then when Hong Kong came along, because you notice the third biggest buyer in the art market is China. And so, and Hong Kong is really the center, right? A lot of the free ports are in Hong Kong, the major sales, the international sales are in Hong Kong. So that we anticipated yet again, that would have a huge impact on the art market. So we already had two factors and then COVID hit. So it's kind of the trifecta of, you know, Brexit, what was happening in Hong Kong and then COVID that kind of led an overall analysis of what's happening um, in the art market. So what are we doing in tor in to, to solve this problem? Um, I kind of called it putting a Band-Aid on a deep wound because the wound is so serious. So what are the auction houses doing? Well, obviously they've moved all their auctions and they are going completely online. There will even potentially be what we call live online sales, right? So what does that actually mean? That means you might actually see someone with a gavel on the day of the sale and then people just getting in and hitting online to get involved in that particular sale. We don't know if there will even be sales in June in New York. Um, I, it's going, it's somewhat doubtful that there will be live sales um, by that time. But that's what they've had to do and we have seen some good results online. Dealers, the dealers, it's incredible what's happening with the dealer marketplace, right? The dealers are collaborating. They've, you know, David Zwerner's created an online platform where other sellers can sell. Um, the museums are creating virtual visits and then art advisors are scrambling to do as many private deals as they can with their existing clientele. So everyone's trying their best, but this is no way um, a solution and or um, a, a way out of this problem. It's going to get worse. And Anita, if we could just focus in on the dealer market for a minute. Um, the, the S, there's approximately 30% of the dealers and galleries that are expected to close. Uh, due to COVID-19. So it appears that the art market might lead to even further inequity, uh, particularly with these small and mid-sized galleries being squeezed out by the larger galleries. How, how do you think that this is actually going to impact the art market? You know, it's, 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 the cream is going to rise to the top. It's that simple. So um, a lot, the biggest losers in this particular scenario are the artists that have no secondary market, which I'm going to address right now. And the galleries that represent artists that don't have a secondary market, what I call emerging artists, they're going to be, in my opinion, the biggest losers in the art market. So very quickly, you know, in looking at opportunities in the art market for buying asset value pieces at a good price, I just, you know, what you need to do is apply the ABC rule which essentially is making sure when you look at all these categories of analysis for a work of art that you want to acquire, you want to make sure that you have a B plus next to each and one of those categories of analysis. Because if they do, then the work you're going to buy, if you purchase it at the right price, will hold its value over time. Galleries that represent um, artists that are emerging artists with, with no secondary market and you know have or have C's, next to each of these categories of analysis are not good buys. They will not uh, stand the test of time. So uh, just to finish up, the first thing I would say is that um, in the dealer marketplace, in this distressed market, 
access has been the opportunity. So a lot of clients that were like the pivotal clients, the important art advisors um, who had access to the best in the back room or the best in the collection. Now um, it, that's opened up and there's more transparency with more access to good artists. In the auction marketplace, you know, you keep, keep a look for distressed sales and estate sales. People that sell now probably are selling for a reason. Right, so those are opportunities as well. And then for art advisors, they're also going to be in the next, you know, four to six months, a lot of distressed sales. Um, but buyer beware, if you do not buy the right work of art with the due diligence, then it's not worth buying anything in a distressed market. And Anita, just to, uh, to expand on that, that particular uh, comment, in your opinion, what sector of the art market has been hurt the most by COVID? Yeah. So if we're looking at fine art, um, it's going to obviously be areas where you have the, the triple whammy. So emerging art is going to get us, it's going to get a kick that's so hard, there's no words to describe it. So emerging artists, absolutely, what I call risky or penny stocks, right? They're, they're the risky assets. But also generationally, um, those works of art where the buyers don't like to buy online. So 19th century certainly is going to continue to suffer. Um, second and third tier um, impressionists and modern works. Post-war contemporary will still dominate. Um, there's no doubt about it, as long as they have a secondary market. So kind of my final thoughts are, one, you want to buy at the right price, but you want to buy still the very best that you can afford. So quality will win out in a distressed market. Be patient. Um, you know, wait for a couple months. Let's see how these auctions do. Um, it's only going to get worse, <laughs> sadly. Um, November will be the health check on the market. If November sales are successful, then Brian, it's time to start <laughs> thinking positively about the economy. If November sales fall, falter, then we've got a real problem. And, um, you know, make sure the last thing I'd say is, you know, if it's too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Um, make sure you do your due diligence. Don't do anything quickly. Okay, thank you so much, Anita. Brad, we've had a, a, a wealth of information so far from the panelists from the standpoint of uh, the economic stability. Anita addressed some issues related to art um, and uh, Brian addressed the real estate market. Can you opine just on the potential tax opportunities as well as implications of the COVID-19 on planning. Could you share a little bit about the tax situation? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I'm gonna try to tie this all together. You know, as a tax lawyer, um, one of my roles is to turn lemon into lemonade. Tax lawyers look at the world upside down. We frequent, uh, frequently, death is a good thing. Uh, <laughs> volatility volatility is, uh, is my friend. Losses, are high grade or low interest rates, our caviar, depressed values could be very manic. And we certainly have a manic depressive environment right now. So there's a lot of planning can be done and you can make, uh, make that lemonade out of the lemons. Uh, the, the, track, the tax lawyer trifecta is low values, low interest rates and high estate and gift tax exemptions, and that's what we have right now. And a lot of the planning that I'm gonna talk about and what I'm doing really uh, flourishes in this environment. And we're gonna talk about specifically real estate and art and how they benefit from this planning and particularly in this uh, uh, environment. Um, I said the first thing on the slide, we talk about uh, the lifetime exemptions that are available for estate and gift tax. These exemptions are at historic highs, meaning that you can pass uh, lots of property down generationally without incurring any estate and gift tax. They've never been anywhere near these numbers. There are basically uh, 11,580,000 per person or about 24 million for married people, uh, married couple. And, um, and for single people, it's basically about uh, 6 million now because it was raised because of inflation. And it's going to six, six and a half million. And what's going to happen, he, uh, excuse me, when Congress, if Congress doesn't do anything, what happens is on December 31st, 2025, uh, these exemptions basically get cut in half. So uh, 
And we all know that the, the best thing that Congress does is nothing. So more likely than not, uh, these exemptions are gonna come down. It'll take about 66 or 67 votes in the Senate to change this. So it's almost an automatic right now. So if, if we assume that the client is gonna live past 2025, we're really looking at about a $6 million exemption per person, about a $13 million exemption per a married couple. So I, what's the message? The message is use it before you lose it. Meaning gift now, transfer now, take those, uh, that property out of your estate right now because the extent that you don't use it, it's gonna be subject to, uh, under current rates, a 40% estate tax exemption at, excuse me, 40% take uh, estate tax rate. And, uh, and if you gift now, all of the appreciation that can take place can be out of the estate as well. And so again, we have low value, so we can transfer assets at low values. We have low interest rates, so we can do transactions between children and parents or other beneficiary, lower generation beneficiaries and with low interest rates, and it really creates some powerful planning. Um, Okay, so, and also these numbers that I talked about could, these high exemptions could go away even sooner uh, if the Democrats take over the presidency and uh, the Senate and keep the House, which I hope, uh, but, uh, but it will have a negative effect on these estate tax exemptions and they may come down lower and sooner. Because as we all know, at some point, the government's gonna have to pay for all this money they're giving out to everybody. And so this might be a way to do that by lowering these exemption, decreasing the estate tax, increasing the rate uh, by raising revenue for the government. Next slide. So basically, you know, what's going on in the real estate market, what's going on in the, in the art market is we have volatility. Volatility creates, uh, potentially creates depressed values. And we can use those depressed values by transferring more and more assets Two to the generations at lower uh, at lower values. So some of the techniques. So it's essentially a freeze of value. So if we're able to take a stock or a real estate or a piece of art that was worth, let's say, ten million last year, and next year or this year it's worth five million or or six million, we can get that piece of art or that piece of real estate out of the estate with uh, at that lower value using up less. Uh, exemption and then allowing uh, us to ultimately transfer more property down the line. So when we do our planning, we don't we go to appraisers and we get a raw value of that asset. But there are techniques that estate and gift lawyers do to depress those values. Uh, the appraisers will look at minority interest discounts. For example, if you have three kids and you give a third of the real estate to each of the three kids, you can get a discount because of the mark minority interest, even though you're giving away the whole thing. Same thing with uh, um, when we go ahead and we create vehicles, we'll drop it into a limited partnership or, or LLC, and through uh, designing those LLCs or partnership, we create some lack of liquidity and that adds to a discounting. And with the virus and the volatility, appraisers are giving very uh, aggressive low values that we can certainly take advantage of. So this is an essential freeze of value, uh, lower values, get it out from an uh, estate and gift tax, and let that thing appreciate in value uh, uh, outside of the estate. So that's really the, the main play that I wanted to talk about today. There are two um, ideas that are kind of our go-to ideas right now. They're intentionally defective grantor trusts. We'll talk about that and also GRATS, or Grantor Retained Annuity Trust. And they both are very good vehicles to transfer assets out of the estate for estate tax purposes. Um, the beauty of the intentionally defective Grantor Trust is that we could either gift and use up our credit or sell or do a combination of the assets to the trust. When the sale, this defective Grantor Trust is intentionally defective in that it is ignored for income tax purposes. So the sale is ignored, there's no capital gain on that sale, but yet the asset at these depressed values are as out of the estate for estate tax purposes. The trust would pay for that. And again, it would pay in the form of a promissory note 
and it would be at very low interest rates. The interest rates right now are at historic lows. And Radical. so. Brad, a quick question about the about the trust. So uh, potentially a client could transfer their real estate interest or their art interest into one of these trusts. However, right. are they able to substitute those assets, say, in the future for other assets of equal value? Yeah, absolutely. That kind of touches on a point that, you know, there's a, as I said before, death can be good news, except, you know, if it's your own. But um, all the assets that you own at death are stepped up in, uh, in, for income tax purposes. The basis is stepped up to fair market value. So if you own an asset in your estate that you purchased uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago for, let's say, uh, $100, and now it's worth uh, $10 million, your beneficiaries can sell that asset uh, and uh, after death and not pay any capital gains on that sale. But when you transfer assets into these trusts, for example, you lose that income tax step up in basis of death. So we design these trusts so that you can swap out assets of equal value. So if you have a highly appreciated asset in these trusts, you switch it out to something like a bond that you may hold in your, in your estate of equal value, the bond theoretically isn't going to appreciate substantially. And then you put the low basis assets in your estate again. And then when you pass away, you get that income tax step up in basis and still have the benefit of getting all that value out of your estate for estate income tax purposes. Okay. So that's uh, how I'd like to answer that. Thank one. you, Brad. Thank you. And then also on this slide, you mentioned uh, the opportunity zones. And in 2018, that was one of the tax law changes where right. the 1031 like kind exchange has been has been actually eliminated. I'm going to just move on to the next slide. Thought you could just uh, address the audience just some of the benefits of possibly utilizing the opportunity zone as a yeah. planning uh, as a well, planning. yeah. A qualified opportunity zones is an amazing tax benefit that Congress uh, and the president gave to uh, essentially very wealthy people. And uh, it, I, I urge people to take advantage of it. And there's an interesting play in the art market. So let's talk about the basics first. The basic plan is that if you have capital gain, long or short, and you do not want to recognize that gain, you can take advantage of this Qualified Opportunity Zone program. And it has three major benefits. First, let's go through them. One is you don't pay tax on the sale, number one. So if you sell the uh, Apple stock, and if you get capital gain for that sale, then you don't pay capital gain on that tax. It gets deferred to as if you uh, made the sale in 2026, December 31st, 2026. So what happens is you get this deferral. You also get it if you sell in 2020 or 2021, you get a 10% discount. So you only pay 90% of the tax or something lower. And we'll talk about that in a second. So you pay, so you get a 10% off, you get this deferral, the six year deferral, uh, seven year deferral. And then the third thing, which is the big thing is that if you reinvest in a qualified business in the qualified opportunity zone, and that's really broad, that all of your gains on that reinvestment are never taxed federally uh, uh, if you hold it more than 10 years. And there's ways to get in and out of these things without but the basic thing is if you, you want to take advantage of this program, you can use uh, the Qualified Opportunity Zone to get those three benefits, the last one being the big one. So if you have real estate, and this is a big real estate crowd listening today, so you, you do have that other uh, opportunity potentially of 1031 transaction. But this turns out to be a saving clause for your failed 1031s because you try for the 1031, you don't, can't identify, you can't close, whatever it is, you can use this as a backup to the 10, uh, 1031. The other interesting thing for, uh, for in, in the art world was they eliminated 1031 like-kind exchanges for tangible property, including art. Well, this program is, I've been able to use in the art world as a substitute for the 1031, and I'll tell you basically how it works. If you have a capital gain, so if you've sold a piece of art, you're not a dealer or an artist, and it generates capital gain, or any other asset, for example, and you want to invest in the art market, you could turn around and create uh, a, a qualified 
opportunity zone business in an art district. Uh, and there's lots of art districts that qualify, um, tremendous amount. And you can open up like a gallery, sell some art just a little bit over time, just to establish that it's a, an active business. But the real goal is to build your inventory over, over time. And then if after 10 years or so, you're building your inventory, you, you sell maybe a piece or two, just so it looks like an active business. The ultimate sale of these, uh, these galleries, and they, including the inventory, ends up being tax-free from, uh, from a federal tax perspective. And many of the states have conformed as well, not California. Now, an interesting play is if you have real estate people, and Anita brought this up before, who may want to get out of art, out of real estate, and into the art market, this is an interesting play that you can do that because they can sell their real estate. Uh, they can't qualify for like kind exchange treatment necessarily because they're going to be outside of real estate, but they could use this plan to develop an art business gallery and build a collection inside that gallery and uh, ultimately uh, be able to uh, uh, sell it at a tax free basis down the line. And so, and this, you get all the benefits of, uh, if it's in your estate for state tax purposes, you get the step up basis and all that. And this is a wonderful area. I mean, it's, we're just touching on one little piece of it, but uh, this is a wonderful area to be discussed. Uh, probably spend a couple hours on it just alone. Thank you so much, Brad. And panelists, uh, just thank you very much, Chris and Brian and Anita and Brad for being on today's presentation. We wanna thank the audience uh, as well for your attendance. We're gonna wrap up now, we are at our hour mark, and we hope that you found today's presentation both informative and helpful. As mentioned earlier, we will be sending out the recorded version of this webinar to all the registrants, and should you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to the panelists directly. Thank you again for attending, and everybody stay safe and healthy. Thank you all. Thank you.